Welcome to the American Computer Museum, everyone, and our beautiful city of Bozeman, Montana. I'm Art Carlson, and everything here is going to help you understand the 4,000-year journey for computers such as this to make it to our homes, our schools, and our workplaces. It's a journey not unlike that of Lewis and Clark, one of surprising and uncharted territories leading humans into this new age of microprocessors and machines that seem to think. In order to grasp our modern high-tech world, we need to look at the origin of numbers, mathematics, and the subsequent need for information processing and calculation. And to do that, we need to go back to the early cultures, such as the Babylonians, more than 4,000 years ago. Unlike our decimal numbering system that uses 10 digits as its base, the Babylonians used a numbering system based on 60. They had wedges for symbols that were pressed into clay tablets. These tablets recorded business transactions, including contracts, numerical quantities, and astrological observations. The Babylonians were not alone. Several other cultures developed their own numbering systems. The Egyptians used pictures or hieroglyphs to represent quantities, as had the early Greeks and the Romans. All of these systems were additive. That is, one had to add the total of all the symbols to get the final number. It wasn't until the Hindus in India that the concept of the modern decimal numbering system, with the current use of a zero, was developed. It became known as the Hindu Arabic numbering system, for the Arabs adopted it, refined it, and spread it into Europe and elsewhere. Once the decimal numbering system took hold, it was just a matter of time before the language of mathematics was developed by these and other brilliant mathematicians. Concepts such as algebra, equations, and calculus were helping us to understand the workings of the world around us. The mysterious was now beginning to be knowable. This book, published in 1700 in London, was probably one of, if not the first book on mathematics for the general public. With a title like Mathematics Made Easy, how can you go wrong? It detailed reasons why the average citizen needed to understand math. Sound familiar? Working with numbers was first the business of hands and brains. In time, pebbles on sand were used to represent numbers. This was improved with wooden beads and rods and metal circular calculators called astrolabes. It was the Europeans who perfected the use of slides, levers, and gears to assist in the challenges of numbers. These display cases contained some early brass-geared calculators dating from the 1880s through about 1900. And one of them was even used in the gold mines near Helena, Montana. Now imagine working in this Chicago office. Your job title was computer. For prior to 1945, the word meant a person who computes. You sat for eight hours a day adding numbers along with 134 other computers in this large, noisy, and at times very hot room. Electric fans strained to keep you comfortable in the hot summers. You were adding hundreds of receipts for the Marshall Fields department store. The comptometer was the machine you used, just like the one in this display case. Believe it or not, the concept of the modern-day computer owes much of its origins to the weaving looms of 19th century Paris. Around the year 1800, a French weaver named Jacquard used punched cards to control the patterns of woven cloth on his machines. The presence or absence of holes on the cards determined the pattern of the cloth. Now this inspired an English mathematician named Babbage to invent a brass and steel calculating machine that could run with a set of instructions or a program punched on cards. His assistant and card programmer was Augusta Ada, considered by many to be the world's first computer programmer. The early office was a mixture of crunching metal sounds, exotic smells of inks on ribbons, and crashing of typewriters on papers. Bosses would dictate letters, secretaries would type them, and errand boys would run in an endless sea of information processing. Merchants could now rely on very heavy calculators to keep their clerks honest. Or who'd want to run off with a 200-pound brass and steel cash register? Black became the standard color for most office machinery. Stark, polished, and accurate became the norm. Numbers and letters needed to be processed, and these machines were one arm and lever away from providing the answers. Muscle power with mechanical precision ruled the day. Do you remember the slide rule? 
Not too long ago, this was the mainstay of scientific calculation. No handheld electronic marvel here. No, this was just sliding scales of bamboo, aluminum, wood, or plastic that students, scientists, and engineers used to design our bridges, roads, homes, and cities. If you're past the age of 30, you probably remember the slide rule, but to much of the younger group, they are, at best, amusing curiosities. The expansion of railroads, telegraphs, and telephones in the late 19th century led to an unprecedented need for computing machines that could process large amounts of information automatically. Both the telegraph and the telephone used a small device called a relay to turn signals on and off. In 1937, George Stibitz at AT&T pioneered the transition of calculating machines away from muscle power and gears and into automatic computers that processed information with telephone relays. Programming these relay-based machines was a formidable challenge. There was no software then. Everything was hardware. Hundreds of wires strung into patterns of logic told the machines what to do while cards punched with the data were fed into openings ready to accept them and transform them into columns of numbers on ledger sheets and business reports. And this is the result. More than 3,000 pounds of machinery and a professional staff of dozens to program and run the typical relay-based computing machine of the 1940s. Now, the punch cards would go here. The relays would also do the logic here. And at the heart of it all, this was the program. Wires directed instructions. People fed the information, and relays did the processing. The modern computerized office was born. In the 1940s, the telephone relay was replaced by the electronic vacuum tube, a much faster and more reliable device. Just as the relay had replaced the gear, the vacuum tube had now displaced the relay. The ABC computer and the ENIAC were the American revolutionary machines to first use electronics for digital computing. On and off was now faster than ever. Punch cards were processed at unprecedented speeds. Commerce was booming. This was the first electronic vacuum tube calculator anyone could buy commercially. Introduced by IBM in 1948, the company claimed it was the equivalent of a room full of engineers, all equipped with slide rules. It weighed in at several thousand pounds, cost more than $20,000, which is about $100,000 today, and had less computing power than a $10 calculator does today. By any measure, it was no pocket rocket. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. But how? To navigate meant having a computer on board the space capsule. How would we put a man on the moon if some of the computers of the 40s and 50s weighed more than an automobile? how to make computers small enough to fit into a small spacecraft, say a command module on its way to the moon. It all began in December of 1947, when the transistor was invented. Small, reliable, and producing much less heat than a vacuum tube, it miniaturized radios, televisions, and computers. In 1958, the miniaturization of transistor circuits made it possible to cram many components into tiny chips. Both the transistors and the chips are made from silicon, which comes from ordinary beach sand. The Apollo moon mission computer became a reality. Here you see the original version of the Apollo navigation computer and the watch worn on the moon by Dave Scott, commander of Apollo 15. The advent of the space age accelerated the popularity and practicality of computers. Welcome to the Compusaurus Hall of Fame. This was state of the art in the early 1960s. It's the IBM 1620 computer, which was used at Montana State University right here in Bozeman. It had only 20,000 bytes of RAM. The hard drive right here weighs 900 pounds, and it carried only two megabytes of memory. A child's video game system today has so much more. And yet, at the time when this was released, it drew rave reviews as being the latest and greatest which prompts the question, 
you wonder what our grandchildren are going to think of our high-tech society. Compusaurus, indeed. Tyrannosaurus rex had nothing on these machines. Big, bulky, needing a small army of specialized programmers, maintenance and operations personnel. These computers were only for large businesses, universities, and governments. The desktop version was just a dream. And here it is, at 250 pounds, 4 kilobytes of RAM, and $18,000 in 1965, the first successful computer to sit on a desktop, the PDP-8. In 1971, the microprocessor was invented. Imagine, most of the computing circuitry mounted on a chip no bigger than your thumbnail. The personal computer became a reality in the mid-1970s, and since then, the microprocessor has ruled the day. If we were to build a Pentium-type computer using vacuum tubes from the ENIAC era, then the machine would be about six feet tall, three feet wide, and 650 miles long, or about the width of Montana for one computer. It would need power generating stations every few miles, unimaginable air conditioning, and a gigantic army of operators to run it. And now, it sits on the tip of your finger. Computers are now so acceptable in so many of our homes and places of work and as entertainment that it's hard to imagine that just in the 1970s and 80s, computers were still considered special devices for a very elite group of people. Boy, how quickly it has all changed. So, come and join us on one of our greatest adventures as we travel from the sands of ancient Egypt to the sands of Silicon Valley. Truly a journey from sand to sand.